Welcome everyone to our event, Understanding the Israeli-Palestinian Colonial Conflict. This event is, is hosted by DSA. DSA is the Democratic Socialists of America. And then this event is specifically put on by NPEC, which is the National Political Education Committee, a little subset here in DSA uh, dedicated to uh, putting out panels about important topics, facilitating uh, conversations about very important issues. Um, and so it's only fitting, of course, that we're here today talking about this particular issue. Before I um, introduce our guests, I'm just going to give us a little preview of what to expect. Uh, we're here in a uh, Zoom webinar so folks uh, can see what's going on. You can make comments to us and uh, the panelists. If you have a question uh, at any point, I would suggest putting it in the Q&A section of the Zoom feature that's below there on your screen. The meeting uh, will be recorded, so folks uh, can absolutely access a, a recording of the meeting if that's something you'd like. What we're going to do today is hear from our two panelists, our two guests, uh, for about 20 minutes or so each. We'll come back. I might ask a few questions, and then we'll turn it on over to you. And that's when I'll go into the question and answer section of Zoom and read a few questions, we'll get a response, and we'll finish up after about an hour and a half total. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to read the uh, summary or introductory statement that was used to advertise this event. I think that's a good way to launch us off. I'll uh, introduce and thank our, our two guests, and then we'll get going. So the statement we put out said that on September 22nd, 1967, shortly after the end of the Six Days War, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz published an ad signed by a dozen Israeli socialists that now reads hauntingly prescient. The ad stated in part, quote, occupation entails foreign rule, foreign rule entails resistance, resistance entails repression, repression entails terror and counter-terror, Victims of terror are mostly innocent people. Holding on to the occupied territories will make us into a nation of murderers and murder victims. That's the end of the quote. Half a century later and 75 years after the Nakba, Palestinians continue to face ethnic cleansing, torture, bombings, and housing demolitions under Israeli occupation. Following the atrocities committed by Hamas on October 7, Israelis' relentless bombardment of Gaza has once again thrust the long struggle for Palestinian liberation back into international headlines. While the mass murder of Palestinians by the Israeli Defense Force is nothing new, the scale of Israel's latest assault on civilian life and infrastructure has rapidly outpaced most conflicts in the last few decades, with more than 1.7 million displaced and more than 15,000 killed, over 6,000 of them children. So pundits and opinion pieces have often claimed uh, the divide between Israelis and Palestinians is just too complicated to understand. So we're coming here together today to ask, how should we understand what's taking place in Gaza and, and across occupied Palestine? What history do we need to know to understand and interpret the present? What can we do in the present to shape the future? And so we're very honored to have Moshe Makover and Sumeya Awad uh, here today to help us answer these questions. And I'll go ahead and, and introduce them here. So Moshe uh, was born in 1936 in Tel Aviv, Palestine. As a student, he joined the Israeli Communist Party from which he was expelled in 1962, together with a small group of party dissidents who challenged the ICP's lack of internal democracy and its subservience to the Soviet Union. In the same year, he founded the socialist organization in Israel better known by the name of its journal, Matspen, an independent radical left group. Moshe Makover is also a mathematician. He's taught at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the University of Bristol and King's College, London. He's an emeritus professor at London University and has lived in London since late uh, 1968. And apart from academic books and papers on uh, mathematical logic and, and social choice, he's written extensively on socialist theory 
mainly applied to Israel, the Middle East, and the Israeli-Palestinian colonial conflict. And then uh, Sumeya Awad is a Palestinian activist and writer dedicated to advocating for the rights of all Palestinians, immigrants, and refugees. Sumeya has written and spoken widely on the Palestinian and refugee solidarity movements. She's been published and interviewed in various outlets, such as The Feminist Wire, Truth Out in These Times, The Middle East Solidarity Magazine, The Huffington Post, and Slate. And she's co-editor co -editor, excuse me, of Palestine, a socialist introduction from Haymarket Books. So with that long introduction out of the way, I wanted to turn it on over to Sumeya. Thanks, Luke, <clears throat> um, and thanks to DSA for organizing this, this panel. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to know where to begin right now, um, given what's happening in Gaza. And it's been almost exactly two months, a little over two months now. And I think many of us remember in the first 24 hours after uh, it became clear what had happened, um, what the, the attacks that Hamas committed, um, the, the details began to emerge that we all recognized that the response from Israel was going to be disproportionate and was going to be um, incredibly uh, bloody and brutal um, and that it wasn't going to just be a few days, that it was going to last a long time. Um, and sure enough, um, all of this was uh, confirmed by various Israeli spokespeople, um, various um, you know, people in the government, members of the government high up, including the president, including the prime minister, including the defense minister, um, when statement after statement affirmed that they were going to quote, flatten Gaza, that this was not going to be a short operation, but that this would last months. Um, and um, also numerous people making it clear that no one quote, quote, no one in Gaza was innocent, um, that everyone was guilty. And that is the destruction that we've seen in the last two months. Um, the death toll, I was checking it before this call, and the death toll right now, um, including people who are still under the rubble, who have not been found and identified, um, is nearly 30,000 people, 30,000 people in, in eight weeks. Um, and the, death, the, the children are nearly 10,000. Um, and we know that that number is higher. We know that that number is much higher because um, given the level of destruction and the fact that there are troops on the ground, it is very difficult to get a, a, a body count um, and to register names. In fact, all the records have been destroyed um, uh, by Israeli forces when they've entered the hospital, they've destroyed all records. Um, and the ground invasion, um, we've already seen this in the last 48 hours, um, but numerous sources are saying from the ground that the next two weeks are going to be the worst. Um, it's, it's difficult to imagine what that means given the last two months, um, but that the combination of the bombings and the forces on the ground and sort of the brutality of it. And, and we saw that this earlier this week with the, the haunting videos of Palestinian men being rounded up and um, forced to undress and then taken in trucks, um, some of them killed, um, others, you know, to be determined what, what is being done to them. And this brings back so many um, images and um, stories from the Nakba in 1948 and the establishment of Israel um, and the ethnic cleansing campaigns that took place in 1948, where um, Palestinians were rounded up in a very similar fashion, um, uh, were forced to dig their own graves and then shot into them, um, where the, the killing and the torture um, uh, was indiscriminate um, and all tactics were used against Palestinians in the establishment of the state of Israel. I actually wanna read a quote from um, in 1948, a military commander during these ethnic cleansing campaigns um, named Igal Alon. And later he became a general in the IDF. He was quoted um, on a diary that was found, an Israeli soldier's diary. Um, and he said the following, this is in 1948. He said, quote, we need to be accurate about timing, place, and those we hit. If we accursed a family, we need to harm them without mercy. 
women and children included. Otherwise, this is not an effective reaction. During the operation, there is no need to distinguish between guilty and not guilty, end quote. And that quote could be read by any of the leaders in Israel today or any of the commanders, and it would fit perfectly um, onto what we're seeing. Um, and the reality is this approach to um, Palestinians uh, is not just in Gaza, but across all of historic Palestine. And it's not just because of the attacks of October 7th, but in fact, similar quotes have been used and said by Israeli leaders, um, even when there hasn't been any sort of quote unquote provocation. 2018, during the um, March of Return, which was this movement in Gaza of Palestinians marching to the militarized fence between Israel and Gaza and sort of demanding the right of return, which is an internationally recognized right that all Palestinians have, that all refugees have, and of course that Palestinians are not allowed to exercise. Um, and the March of Return was actually led by this really incredible writer named Ahmed Abu Tema, who is in Gaza and who has been speaking about um, uh, Israel's atrocities in the last two months. And because of his um, uh, activism, because of him sort of reporting from the ground, his home was targeted um, by a bomb uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and he survived. However, uh, many of his families did not, including his son, uh, Abdullah, who was killed in, in, in the bombings. Um, but people should be familiar with Ahmed Abu Tema, and I encourage you all to look him up and, and read his writings. Um, past writings and also today. But in 2018, as these marches, these peaceful marches to out to um, the border uh, were happening, Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman at the time said, I'm quoting, there are no innocent people in Gaza. Um, and this was after a video was leaked of Israeli soldiers cheering on and laughing um, as live ammunition was used against Palestinian protesters. Um, and similar videos of, are coming out of Gaza today of Israeli soldiers dancing over the rubble, of Israeli soldiers um, uh, holding like engagements over the rubble, riding bicycles stolen from Palestinian children, destroying Palestinian toy stores and libraries, um, and of course hoisting the Israeli flag um, over neighborhoods that have been carpet bombed, completely carpet bombed. Um, over 45% of all infrastructure in Gaza has been destroyed. And if the bombing continues and the destruction continues at the rate that it's been going, there would not be a single structure in all of the Gaza Strip um, left undamaged by Christmas, so in the next two weeks. Um, and still Israel is continuing with this destruction and the US is continuing to support, to support it. And I'll touch on that in a bit, but everything we're seeing in Gaza today, um, everything that we're seeing in Occupied West Bank, you know, there's um, Janine refugee camp was bombed in Occupied West Bank in the last two months, uh, several times. Um, Palestinians are being rounded up across the Occupied West Bank, as well as in, in Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel are being arrested for speaking out uh, for something as simple as a social media post. Um, people are being arrested um, and not, not charged, of course. Um, not given a fair trial. Um, in fact, in the last two months, the number of Palestinians arrested by Israel has far exceeded um, the number of Palestinian prisoners released during these exchanges um, of hostages. Um, and that number keeps climbing. And all of this is not an anomaly. I think often people are saying like, this is a result of this right-wing government in Israel. This is a result of Netanyahu as though if Netanyahu were not in power and a different president was in power, that things would be different. And the reality is the successive Israeli administrations have held on to the very same um, ideology of Zionism, which is inherently violent. Um, it is based on the idea that from the river to the sea will be cleared of Palestinians um, and of Arabs, and that it is, um, it is a Jewish supremacist ideology. Um, and the founders of Zionism were very clear in that it would be a very violent project, um, that it is, quote, quote, Jabotinsky, one of sort of the fathers of Zionism and uh, what became Israel, um, had said that Zionism, quote, was a uh, colonizing adventure, end quote. 
And so it's it very clear to them what it would take. They were under no illusions of the kind of violence and ethnic cleansing um, that was at the heart of Zionism. Um, and there are so many examples that I will get into, but I think that um, Moshe will later, um, of, of what the Zionist ideology stands for and why it is so important to name it today as we're building this movement against Israel's ethnic cleansing, against Israeli apartheid, against Israeli occupation, against what's happening in Gaza, to name Zionism for what it is um, and to make it clear that it does not actually stand for uh, Judaism um, and that the two cannot be conflated. Um, and this is also so important because this is how Israel is able to uh, create this image of itself as a victim um, and garner support through that. And I think that's slowly beginning to fade um, or crack, I should say, um, especially given the last two months. Um, I think one of the things that makes the, the current situation we're in sort of stand out is, as Luke said in the opening, the, the level of destruction, the level of um, massacre that we're seeing in such a short amount of time and how blatant it is. Um, it is so blatant, they're not even trying to cover up what they're doing um, when they're bombing hospitals and schools, um, uh, when Israel told Palestinians to flee to the south and then bombed the convoys of Palestinians fleeing, um, the, the blockading and, and uh, not allowing fuel and water and electricity. Um, the UN and the WHO have already warned that you know, if Palestinians are not dying from the bombs, they're very soon going to start dying of starvation and dehydration um, and other illnesses that um, come about as a result of lack of water, lack of, lack of clean water. A lot of the aquifers in Gaza are being contaminated because Israel is choosing to flood tunnels, um, saying that this is how they're going to get to Hamas, when in fact all that does is contaminate water aquifers that are providing clean water for people. Um, and anyway, the, the list of these sort of uh, atrocities is, is long. Um, the fact that they're targeting, openly targeting journalists, um, openly targeting those speaking out on social media. Um, Rifat, who is an incredible Palestinian writer and poet, um, was just killed in, in his sister's home. And it was a targeted attack um, because he was speaking out. In fact, his last tweet, his last tweet um, was accusing the Biden administration and the US of being complicit, of being the reason that Palestinians are being killed. Um, and then he was killed. Um, so it is all very blatant and almost every institution that you can think of that is responsible for reporting on human rights abuses, that is responsible for providing relief has said that Israel is um, in the process of committing a, this genocide in Gaza, a genocide against Palestinians. And still the US government is standing by Israel, standing firmly by Israel, um, not just uh, politically, um, but uh, financially and militarily with the billions of dollars that are going to Israel from US taxpayers um, and the, the US weapons industry that is supplying Israel with many of the weapons, many of the bombs that are falling on Palestinians in Gaza um, and, and much of the um, equipment that is also used across the occupied West Bank. Um, and, there are many, many reasons for this support for Israel um, from the US. Um, part of it is just the, the long and deep history of US-Israel relations, the quote unquote special relationship between the two. Um, the fact that our president Biden, um, who has been in the US government um, first as a senator and then as vice president and now as president for nearly 50 years, um, 50 years of this special relationship between the two countries, um, and of course, the, the fact that the billions of dollars that Israel gets every year and the additional funds, right now it's an additional 14 billion, um, all help prop up the military industrial complex in the US and the various weapons manufacturers that benefit greatly from this relationship. In fact, there's a, there's a special clause in the military funding that Israel gets from the US. It's $3.8 billion a year. And there's a clause in that um, agreement that stipulates that Israel has to use um, a certain percentage of that money on buying weapons that are specifically US produced weapons. So it directly goes back into the arms, the US arms economy. Um, 
And that explains, in part, that explains this relationship. Sorry, I got distracted by the chat. I'm not going to look at the chat. Um, that explains, that in part explains a special relationship um, and explains the level of repression that people in the US are facing for speaking out in support of Palestine um, on every single level, from people losing their jobs to students um, being suspended, student groups being suspended, and to um, uh, um, large universities and labor unions facing enormous backlash, um, and of course, members of Congress. That said, there is this really enormous, powerful, and I think quite inspiring movement that has sprung up in the last two months for Palestine, and one that has reached um, areas in the US that um, before today have not been vocal on this issue um, for, for many reasons. And I, I don't have time to go into this too much, but the example I'll give right now, which is one of the most recent examples, is the unions coming out in support of a ceasefire. Um, and uh, the UAW, the United Auto Workers, who just came out of a really big and inspiring strike, which they won, um, officially endorsed and came out in support of a ceasefire on uh, Friday, December 1st. Um, and this was a massive step. Um, and this is a union that Biden had supported during the strike and that the, the Biden administration actually is counting on for their reelection. And for them to come out in support of a, a, of a ceasefire, I think indicates this shift that we're seeing, this massive shift. And the fact that the momentum is continuing to build for a ceasefire, continuing to build against the stance that the US government has chosen to take in support of genocide and complicity in genocide. Um, the question is, what will the turning point be um, just yesterday, the UN vetoed a Security Council resolution um, uh, demanding a ceasefire. Um, the UN, the US was the only country to vote against. The UK abstained, um, and I think it's it's showing that the US is just digging its heels in, um, choosing to support Israel, no quote unquote, no matter what. Um, I think there is a looming question of what kind of escalation is necessary, what kind of pressure is necessary to, um, to force the government to, to, uh, to pressure Israel into a ceasefire. The reality is that the US government has the power. Many people are like, oh, you know, what power does Biden have over Israel? The reality is quite a bit of power actually over Israel, um, as well as in these institutions of, of um, international power like the Security Council. Um, where a vote could force things to flip. Um, I want to I want to say a lot more, but I'm running out of time. So I'll end by saying, um, when we're fighting for Palestinian freedom, we're fighting against the um, Israeli um, uh, genocide unfolding in Gaza against the blockade. Um, we're not just talking about these fragmented sections of historic Palestine. Uh, but our understanding and our starting point needs to be full decolonization um, of, of Palestine. And, and that's where the, the phrase from the river to the sea comes from. And it's actually quite a, a liberating phrase because it's calling for freedom for everyone between the river and the sea. And it's um, sort of grounded in the idea that full decolonization of historic Palestine means that um, everyone living on that land will be treated equally and that our rights are not based on our identity, as is the case right now, where your rights, where you're allowed to go, how you're allowed to live, um, are all based on your identity. And from the river to the sea is a call that, no, that should not be how we live, that it should be freedom for all, regardless of identity, of culture, of religion. Um, and that needs to be our starting point. And I'm saying this because in the opening, Luke mentioned 1967, and um, ending the occupation of the 1967 territories. But in fact, our starting point needs to be 1948 and ending the occupation and the colonization of all Palestinian land and instead seeing a future and building towards a future where that all of that land is not fragmented, but is instead a, a contiguous piece of land um, where everyone is, is living freely and, and with equal rights. And I'm actually gonna end by reading um, the poem that Rifat, who I mentioned earlier, had written um, on November 1st in sort of amidst the, the, the bombing campaigns 
Um, it was a time where a lot of Palestinian poets, a lot of journalists, a lot of writers, a lot of those speaking out in Gaza were being targeted and killed. Um, and he wrote this poem. And uh, five weeks later, he, he too would, um, would be killed by Israel. So I'm gonna end by reading it. If Ad writes, if I must die, you must live. To tell my story, to sell my things. To buy a piece of cloth and some strings. Make it white with a long tail. So that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a tale. And that's precisely why we're all continuing to fight and um, regardless of how long this lasts, that we're committed, that we have this responsibility and that we're committed to uh, fighting for a free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you, Sumeya. Appreciate that. Just a reminder, folks can keep sharing questions in the Q&A section as we go along. We'll come to those. Um, but for now, I'll turn it on over to Moshe. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you in these sad times. Uh, I find it difficult to, to speak. I find it difficult to sleep. Uh, I want to, uh, uh, and, and of course, it's, it's a privilege to uh, uh, be speaking alongside uh, Sumaya. Uh, I, I want to take a, a, a little bit of a distance and to explain why so much of what is happening uh, could have been predicted and in fact was predicted. Uh, Luke quoted uh, this uh, statement that was published in the Aritz on 22nd of September 1967. This, this was a, a response. I, I was one of the 12 signatories, and I think I'm, I'm the only one who, who is still alive. That was 60, 56 years ago. Um, uh, this was a response of what is going to happen uh, uh, if Israel keeps the uh, territory that it occupied in 67 uh, and does not withdraw from them. But of course, uh, uh, this prediction was accurate. Uh, and of course, as Sumaya pointed out, it didn't start in 1967. This was a reaction in 67 to current events, but the whole thing didn't start. And I want to explain. And I want to take a, 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 a sort of a, a long view of, of uh, matters. Let me quote from a famous uh, uh, description of um, how uh, settlers view the uh, indigenous people uh, in whose country they, they settle. I, I'm changing, I'm going to first read it to change one word in, in the original. The text should be familiar to most of you. Uh, they uh, complain about the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Palestinian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Sound familiar? Well, it should sound familiar because it's a quote from the US Declaration of Independence. And it doesn't speak about Palestinians. I'll read the, the quote again in its original form. It's a complaint, one of the complaints against the uh, English king who has, uh, uh, has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. There's a few striking things in this, in this little uh, complaint. Uh, how come these uh, Indian savages are 
at our frontier. Well, they were uh, out there all the time. We are here, the settlers are here, and they are at the frontier. Did it start this way? How come they are, they've been pushed to the frontier? Um, the a complaint uh, about uh, atrocities uh, are no doubt uh, with some foundation. What it uh, omits to mention is that the atrocities committed by the settlers were on a far larger, incomparably larger scale. Um, and there are many other things that, that can be uh, said about this. I am quoting this because I want it. I want to point out the uh, uh, rather strong analogy between the colonization of the North of America, especially the North of the part that did not uh, rely on plantation, the part the part that uh, relied on the self work of the settlers, and the uh, uh, Zionist project of colonization. There are a lot of structural similarities from which we can learn quite a lot. And I think, you know, for, for Americans, it is uh, very important to keep these, these uh, structural analogies uh, in, in mind. Of course, uh, the uh, immediate observation is that the conflict is not a symmetric one. It is often represent, misrepresented as a symmetric conflict. There are two uh, communities, two nations fighting over some uh, territory. This is far from the case, and it was far from the case in the, in the, in, 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 in North America. Uh, there is a huge disparity of power. And there are many parallels. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, colonization of North America was uh, uh, fueled by the ideology of manifest destiny. Zionism has gone one better than manifest destiny. It has divine promise. It's got a, 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 a charter from God itself, himself or herself to colonize the uh, land of Israel. I think we should take Zionism very seriously. It has been a, a very successful endeavor, uh, one of the most successful in, in modern times. We should take it very seriously and read very carefully what, what it is and what it, it, it uh, aimed to be. And I'm talking mainly not about Zionist ideology. The ideology is important. I'm not only talking about the Zionist movement, it is a movement as well. Uh, and like every movement, it has many strands, many, many uh, sections, uh, many factions. But I'm talking about the Zionist project, because what Zionism is really about is a certain project. And, and it is important to understand what the project was. The project has been, right from the start, was the colonization of Palestine by Jews uh, in order to uh, set up a Jewish nation state in the whole of Palestine. That was, uh, from the beginning, the, the uh, aim of the Zionist project. Uh, it was not at first, in the first uh, uh, decades of its existence, very widely broadcast in order not to frighten the horses, not to, not to alert uh, people. But uh, in internal documents, it is very clear. The first time when it was really uh, published publicly uh, uh, in, in a formal way was perhaps in the uh, conference that took place in, in the uh, Biltmore Hotel in uh, New York, in May 1942. And there it is, it is very clear that the aim of the Zionist project is to set up a, a Jewish state in Palestine from the river to the sea, a Jewish nation state. Now that had certain implications as to the form of colonizations because colonization has in, in modern times has various forms. And I'm going to apply here 
the strictly Marxist classification of uh, colonization, because I think it is important. If you, excuse me, yeah, I hope it is permissible to refer to Marx in this form. Uh, Marxist classification recognizes uh, basically three forms of colonization. One is, uh, two of which actually occurred in North America. One is plantation colonization based on slavery. This uh, sounds familiar. It happened in, in part of what became the United States. The second type is colonization, which is aimed at exploiting the labor power of the indigenous, or based on the labor power of the indigenous uh, people. Uh, it's political economy is based not on slavery, but on exploiting the labor power of the indigenous population. This did not occur in North America. This did not occur in Palestine. And it's important to understand why it did not occur in Palestine. What occurred in Palestine is a, a form of colonization like in the rest of North America, which is based on the uh, settlers themselves being the main direct producers. And why? Because if Zionist colonization would have been based on exploiting the labor power of the indigenous people, they would have been a necessary asset as uh, the, the indigenous people were in South Africa, for example. In South Africa, there was not basically ethnic cleansing uh, of, of the indigenous people from what be became the, the colony of South Africa. Their land was taken away, but they were a useful asset in terms of their labor power. But the Zionists understood what every child can understand, that the direct producers are always the majority in every society. But the majority of, of the population in every, in every uh, pol uh, political economic, economic society are uh, uh, the direct producers. They are, they are the majority. If uh, Zionism had aimed to base itself on the labor power of the indigenous people, then uh, it could not become a, a Jewish nation state. It would become what be, what happened in, in South Africa, in Algeria, and in the rest of, uh, uh, mostly in Africa, where uh, the settlers coalesced into a quasi-class of exploiters, uh, and uh, the majority of the people uh, remained the indigenous. Uh, it, it, was, it, it, it was not uh, possible to create a Jewish nation state by uh, uh, basing the political economy of the settlement on the labor power of the uh, indigenous people. So what is to become of them? Well, the obvious uh, answer is if they cannot be overwhelmed by huge immigration of Jews, which was not uh, possible and was not was never never a, a, a remote possibility then the only answer is ethnic cleansing so from the beginning the very Zionist project uh, aimed and assumed uh, at uh, ethnically cleansing the uh, indigenous Palestinian uh, Arab population now notice that in all other places where this type of colonization based on the self work of, of the settlers took place, the uh, settlers had become the overwhelming majority. The indigenous people have been ethnically cleansed or reduced to a, a small minority. Uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, this is this is uh, what uh, has stabilized. This is the case in North America. This is the case in Australia, uh, and uh, elsewhere in New Zealand, uh, in uh, Tasmania, the indigenous population was was completely annihilated, exterminated to almost to the last person. In this. View in if you look at it in this view, then the Zionist project is still work in progress. 
and we see its progress right now before our eyes. The uh, uh, wish and the plan of uh, the Zionist project to ethnically cleanse the Palestinian uh, population of the areas which it is controlled, it controls, which is the, the uh, area between the river uh, to the sea, plus a little bit of Syria, which people uh, often forget. Uh, this, this is designed to be ethnically cleansed. This is why ethnic cleansing has been predicted, could be predicted, has been predicted. I predicted uh, personally, I'm not the only one, that ethnic cleansing is going to take place at some point. I did not, of course, I couldn't predict it would start in Gaza. Uh, this, this was fortuitous. And note, again, another uh, uh, analogy, similarity between the Zionist project and what took place uh, centuries ago in North America. Uh, every expansion of the uh, colonial occupation, every uh, stage of ethnic cleansing, uh, or almost every, every one of these, took place in response to some uh, apparent provocation. If you look at uh, the way that the indigenous uh, Americans were uh, ethnically cleansed, it was very often in response to some atrocity that they uh, had committed or to some other uh, uh, opportunity that presented itself. In Zionist uh, uh, terminology, there is a, a term that refers to uh, this idea as the opportune moment, the opportune moment to uh, perpetrate another stage of expansionism, another stage of ethnic cleansing. Uh, in, in Hebrew, it is sha'at ha-kosher, sha'at ha-kosher, the, the opportune moment. The opportune moment uh, is uh, sometimes unpredictable. Uh, it presents itself. It may be a regional war. Uh, some people uh, expected in uh, the year 2002, uh, in, in view of the forthcoming uh, invasion of uh, Iraq, which was predicted to, to happen in the following year, uh, there was some talk of using that opportune moment to perpetrate ethnic cleansing uh, on a large scale in the, in the West Bank. This was known as the Sharon plan. Uh, it didn't come to uh, in, in get, it, get uh, 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 actually done because the, the war, uh, as it were, ended too quickly. There was not, not, not enough opportunity to uh, uh, perpetrate uh, ethnic cleansing. So, uh, I would. I, I think I've, I've exhausted my my time. Uh, I think what is what is happening right now is not as it is put uh, uh, as it is named by the media a war of uh, Israel and Hamas. It is a war of Israel against the Palestinian people, and its real aim is not the eradication of Hamas. This is a convenient uh, pretext for prolonging the war as long as necessary because eradication of Hamas is an open-ended uh, uh, target. The, the real aim of the war is ethnic cleansing. And this is happening right in front of our eyes. It is, uh, the, the method is genocide. The aim is ethnic cleansing. And this is not going to uh, uh, stop there if Israel is allowed to do it. Of course, there are international uh, uh, forces, primarily the United States, that could stop it if it like, but it didn't. I mean, I, I want to point out one very important specific uh, 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 aspect of Zionist colonization. Unlike the colonization of America or Australia, where the colonizers were sent by a, a metropolis, a mother country, to uh, colonize that and was protected by the mother country. The Zionist colonizers did not have a mother country. 
they needed the surrogate mother. And their surrogate mother was the empire with the dominated that part of the world. Originally, it was Britain. And uh, during a certain period, it was France. But then from the 1960s, it firmly became the United States. The United States is the surrogate, surrogate metropolis, surrogate mother country of Zionist uh, uh, colonization. And it, the, the, the deal is always that uh, the Zionist colonization project would uh, obtain the, the, the uh, protection of this surrogate mother in uh, exchange for services rendered. And the services rendered by Zionist colonization to the United States, uh, apart from uh, what Sumaya has referred to is being an attack dog of American power in the region. And in this respect, the, the United States is supporting Israeli savage uh, 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 warfare in order to, to show everyone and every country, every state in, in the region that this is, a, 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 this is a, a mad dog that can, can wreak havoc and if you dare to uh, oppose us, we can uh, let loose this this protege of ours, uh, uh, and 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 you you will see you will see the the, the effects. Uh, of course, uh, the, the uh, there is a ray of of hope in the form of a mass mobilization in in many countries uh, in. Uh, who, who was who are who are appalled by uh, what is going on and uh, call for a stopping uh, an immediate stop to this ethnic cleansing. Thank you. Thank you, Moshe. I want to encourage folks who uh, might have joined us a little later or might just appreciate an extra word of encouragement to uh, share your questions in the Q&A uh, section here on Zoom. I'll go ahead and um, pose just one or two questions uh, to both Moshe and Sumeya. And, you know, if, if you all would like to take them on, that's fine. Um, either one of you, and then I'll go ahead and, and turn it on over to uh, some of the questions that we've been getting from from folks in the audience. Um, so I was curious, um, and perhaps uh, Sumeya, this one is to you a little bit more, but of course both of you can can answer this. Um, what what other struggles you kind of see as as tied to uh, Palestinian liberation, um, and how that shapes uh, the way that that we organize and how it kind of shapes our uh, response. Um, and then Moshe, a, a, a little bit more directed towards you. And of course, Sumeya, you can answer as well, but, you know, Moshe, you're, you're coming to us, um, from another country. What kind of responses you've seen, uh, from your country, um, what you think folks in the United States, uh, should know, uh, about, uh, what's currently going on in Britain. Uh, I know you also explained, uh, some of the past there. Thanks, Luke. Um, and thanks, Moshe, for, for all of that. Um, I mean, in, in some ways, it's like what struggle is not connected to the Palestinian struggle. Um, it's like every, there's so many connections and lines to be drawn um, because the Palestinian struggle sort of brings out all the different elements of um, capitalism and militarism um that are impacting and that are sort of the, the foreground for so many of the other um forms of oppression or struggles against oppression that we see around the world um i think in the us in particular some of the ones that have some of the the struggles that have kind of allied themselves and aligned themselves with the palestinian struggle the most because of the very clear and obvious connections are the struggle for black liberation um, the, the indigenous struggle in the US um, and more recently the climate, climate struggle, climate justice. 
I think for um, movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter, there are so many connections, many of them symbolic and um, sort of drawing on the role of imperialism in the oppression that Black people um, faced historically and continue to face today, and then more direct material links between um, the you know, police brutality um, and racism, et cetera, in the US and what is happening in Palestine. And I think that was brought to the foreground um, in the last decade um, when it became clear and apparent and sort of um, uh, all this data was produced to show the links between police departments in the US um, and some of the most violent police departments in the US and the big cities like Los Angeles and New York and Chicago. Um, and their ties to the Israeli army, um, the fact that many of these um, police, um, uh, I was going to say battalions, I mean, that, that works, but that's not what we call them in the US, but they may as well be battalions, are actually often trained in Israel by the Israeli army in tactics and strategies that, the, that they then take back and use um, against people in the US. And more often than not, that is black and brown people in the US. Um, and there is a really massive campaign to sort of end this exchange and this police exchange between the two um, that was quite successful. Um, and um, another connection that is also tied to this, tied to policing um, is the, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but is sort of the, the, um, the militarism and the arms industry in the US and its connection to Israel, both the, the financial connection, the fact that Israel buys a lot of uh, weapons, a lot of arms from the U.S., um, U.S. produced, um, and that a lot of its um, airplanes and um, bombs are created by Boeing, for example, which is based here in the U.S., and some of its largest factories um, are in places like New Jersey and St. Louis um, and Atlanta, um, and they've been targeted, actually, in the last two months by protesters um, and internally by workers trying to strategize about how to sort of organize against manufacturing and producing these, these weapons. Um, and then also um, uh, because Israel it produces the most arms per capita in the world. And a lot of the, um, it's, it's a leading, it's leading in military technology. And a lot of the technology that it produces, it tests first on Palestinians, including on Palestinians in Gaza um, and Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. A lot of it's like facial recognition uh, technology that, it, that is used by, by the Israeli military um, to, name, to name one, but there are many other examples. NSO Group, which is this, another surveillance technology that's actually been blacklisted by the US government, um, which should tell you something. Um, uh, Israel produces these, tests them on Palestinians, and then exports them to various regimes around the world who then use them themselves against dissidents domestically. Um, and we know this is the case with like the Emirates using it against dissidents. Um, uh, we know they've been used in Mexico um, uh, and the, the India, um, as well as other places. Um, and so it's like all of this military technology that is being produced, it is, isn't just affecting Palestinians, it's affecting anyone organizing anywhere in the world. Um, it was used in, by, by Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, so it's, it's, it's not this um, siloed struggle. Um, it's very much connected to other struggles against uh, various right-wing governments globally. Um, and then of course, um, I don't wanna take up too much time, but I'll just briefly mention the, the climate struggle. And I think one, of, one thing that has happened in the last few years is the connection between climate justice um, in the US and elsewhere um, to what Israel is doing, uh, to imperialism, to war. Um, and this is especially important in the case of Palestine because Israel does a lot of greenwashing. It tries to sort of claim and create this image of itself as a environmentally friendly uh, country, which is so laughable if it weren't so you know, violent and, and harrowing. Um, but there, you know, there's no such thing as an environmentally friendly apartheid state. Uh, you can't, you can't have those two things together. Um, and in fact, that Israel is, you know, actively destroying um, the land, actively destroying the ecology of Palestine and of the region. Um, and that's been, I think, one, one um, really powerful and sort of inspiring 
um, uh, development in the last few years is connecting climate justice to Palestine. And in the US, we've seen that on numerous occasions, like most recently with Sierra Club workers. Sierra Club is one of, is the largest, I think the largest environmental organization in the US. And while its leadership is not great, um, the workers in Sierra Club have been organizing to stop, you know, these environmental trips to, to Israel um, that, that, are, that take part in greenwashing and sort of bringing out the fact that you can't say you are pro-climate justice, that you care about the environment and support um, and uplift an, an apartheid regime and occupation. Thank you. Moshe, I don't know if you had thoughts about this. There were two questions. I'd like to answer very briefly the, the second. Uh, as you may know, uh, uh, Britain is one of the countries whose establishment is a, a, a poodle of American hegemony. It is not a, a, co a coincidence that in the recent vote in the Security Council, Britain was the only one that did not vote, vote for the resolution, apart from the United States that voted it, voted, vetoed it. Uh, Britain abstained, where, whereas France, for example, uh, voted for the resolution. So there's a distinction here. This is on the surface and as far as the establishment is concerned. If you uh, just follow the, the expressions of the elite uh, and follow the, the mainstream media, then you would think that the, that the majority of British public opinion is, is supporting Israel. But the truth is very different. I mean, there has been a, a a few days ago, uh, 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 an article, a revealing article in The Guardian uh, by uh, Amitya, Amitya uh, Chakraborty uh, describing the overwhelming support for Palestinian rights among uh, the younger uh, part of the British population, in particular working class uh, uh, youth. Uh, he concentrated on a on township uh, north of London, which is a, a, a working class uh, concentration. Uh, and there has been a wonderful activity uh, in militancy uh, of, of these young people, uh, secondary school uh, students in support of Palestinian rights and in opposition to the position of the, the uh, British establishment and mainstream media. Uh, as for the other question, uh, it is a, a very heavy subject. My answer to this is that the struggle to which uh, the struggle for uh, equal rights in uh, Palestine, as, as the saying goes be between the river and the, and the uh, sea, the, the, the other struggle to, to which it is intimately connected is the struggle for socialism. It is a, a complicated subject, but I, I want to point out that in my view, uh, it, it will be impossible to achieve liberation in, in uh, uh, Palestine as a, a separate country, apart from developments in the whole region. And uh, it, it could not be done in a, within within the confines of the uh, capitalist order. I've explained my position in detail in in an article uh, on the decolonization of Palestine. This is the title: "Decolonization of Palestine," which is archived in the uh, archive of the Weekly Worker, uh, uh, a weekly journal, left wing journal in, in Britain. The, 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 to, to, to give you just a summary is the, the, the idea uh, that you have to, you have to understand is that uh, the uh, liberation of, of Palestine involves overthrow of the Zionist regime. Now, overthrowing the Zionist regime is not uh, 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 an, an easy target. Who can do it? 
if you compare the, the situation uh, to what uh, existed in South Africa under apartheid, uh, the, the difference becomes very clear. In South Africa, uh, there was an internal force, namely the, the majority population, the majority of the producers, the majority of the working class, which had leverage uh, to overthrow, uh, sufficient to overthrow the, the apartheid regime. In the case of, of Israel-Palestine, it is not an, a, 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 an easy question. I, I, it, it doesn't seem that there, is, there exists an external for, force, external to, to Israeli society that is capable of overthrowing the Zionist regime. Who can do it? I mean, just think about it. In my opinion, it will involve the uh, agreement the participation uh, of a, a, a large part of the Israeli working class itself. Now, under the present conditions, under the present capitalist conditions, this is this is uh, not a likely thing to happen. It can happen given socialist transformations of the entire Middle East region. I cannot enlarge on this because this is not an, a, a simple subject. But just think that uh, the decolonization of Palestine involves overthrow of the Zionist regime. And then think what force is both capable and interested in achieving this. Uh, this is a, a starting point for, for some uh, necessary thinking. I, I cannot go on about it. If you, if, if you want a, a development of this idea, then it, it requires a, a, a session in its own right. But I direct you to my article on the decolonization of Palestine, archived in the uh, Weekly Worker uh, archive. Can I, sorry, can I add something to that? Thanks so much for that, Moshe. I, I don't want to, um do a back and forth about the role of the Israeli working class. Um, but I, I do think one thing that that I want to highlight that you said, which is that Palestine does not, Palestine's not an island. Um, I think this is something many of us have been saying for a long time, especially in the last two months, that we can't silo Palestine off of the rest of the region. Um, and I think this was especially made clear during the Arab uprisings um, in 2011 onwards. Um, because it became clear that actually Palestine was a rallying cry for much of the Arab, much of the Middle Eastern working class and continues to be today. I mean, a few weeks ago, and I believe this is continuing, um, Syrians in Idlib were being, who were being bombed by Assad forces and bombed by Russian forces as well, came out into the street. They canceled Friday prayers because of the bombings, because it was unsafe, but they still went out into the streets to protest um, Israel's bombing of Gaza. That brought them out. Um, and this is, of course, in, in Syria, like the um, Syrians protesting in Idlib, this is also protesting against the way Palestinians in Syria have been treated. Um, the Yarmouk refugee camp, which was completely desecrated and flattened by Assad forces. Um, and this is just one example in Syria, but of course in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Iraq. And all of this has to be calculated and we have to think about it as we think about what it looks like for Palestinians um, to be free and the, the connection between all these different people. I mean, the reality is there are millions of Palestinian refugees across the Middle East. And one of the things that we demand as Palestinians as we're struggling for freedom and one of the demands of the boycott divestment sanctions movement is the right of return. Um, and that means the right of return of all Palestinians to their occupied homes and lands. And again, this is a right that is enshrined by international law. Um, and so I, I wanted to say that, and I think that, you know, the role of the Israeli working class, I, I agree with you insofar as I don't think as it stands, um, the Israeli working class is an ally in any way. And that's because of the structure and the design of the Israeli state and the fact that Israeli workers actually are uh, central to the, the reproduction of Zionism and of the settler colonial project of Israel today. Um, and we're seeing this right now, like in Gaza, in the West Bank, et cetera. 
um, the, the, the overall arch in question that you raised, I think is a question is like, what, what will it take for them to be transformed to, to be allies against um, the, the occupation? And, you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical <laughs> um, of, of that happening. Um, but I definitely think that the, the role of the Arab working class is central to this. Um, and I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you both so much. So what I'm going to do now, uh, we have about nine questions in the Q&A box. I think what I'll do is um, read through about four of them. Um, I'll pause, see if you both would like me to continue reading through the rest, um, give you all a, a chance to respond. And I think maybe, you know, both of you latching on to either the ones that are directed to you um, or latching on to the parts that resonate the most uh, to you. I'm sure folks will understand if you can't answer every little bit of the question, but more so are kind of responding to, you know, some of the, the, the sentiments or some of the themes here. So the first question we have um, directed at Moshe, in, in previous talks and essays, you've alluded to the small size and relative importance of the Israeli anti-war movement and or the, the peace camp. Is there any reason to think that there is greater anti-war sentiment or pro-peace sentiment among the youngest politically active Israelis, particularly Ashkenazis? If not, why not? That's one. We have another question. Uh, what kind of tangible action can Palestinian liberation forces take that would not be dismissed as atrocities and also move Palestine closer to decolonization? We have another uh, question here asking us to comment on the role of the Democratic Party in this issue. Uh, and Moshe, for you, could be the Democrats, any other political party. Should socialists support representatives who vote for Israeli funding, even if they call themselves socialists? And then I'll read this next one here. Does the US once again vetoing a ceasefire uh, while claiming that not doing so would embolden Hamas confirm their imperialist alliance? And then in terms of the uh, histories of colonization, does the distinction between Israel and South Africa make the use of apartheid uh, misleading? What's important about it uh, instead uh, saying, or excuse me, what is important about instead saying uh, Israeli ethnic cleansing? So I can continue reading through. I don't know if you all would like to, uh, me to pause and, and uh, respond to any of those. I'll go ahead and, oh, go ahead. Moshe, would you like to begin? And then I can respond and then we can take more okay, questions. Okay, I would like to address, you know, maybe a couple of these questions. Sure. At the moment, uh, anti-war uh, feeling in Israel among young people is is uh, very, very uh, uh, tiny. I mean, there are still some brave people who uh, demonstrate and who, uh, speak against the war, but uh, the, at the moment, as happens in most wars, the Israeli uh, public opinion is uh, in uh, hysteria, uh, pro-war hysteria. That doesn't mean that it is united. I mean, contrary to what happens very often in, in the times of war where the, the, the nation is united, Israeli public opinion is deeply divided, but it's deeply divided not in its attitude to the war, but in its uh, 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 feeling as to who is responsible for this uh, uh, trauma that uh, afflicted Israel on the 7th of, of October. And it is clear that uh, uh, the, the, there was a big fa failure of the uh, top brass of the army, and of uh, Netanyahu personally, it is it is 
documented, it is uh, uh, widely known that, uh, that uh, Netanyahu actually fostered uh, Hamas in, in, in Gaza in order to divide the Palestinian leadership and in order to prevent any talk of uh, the uh, two-state illusion. I point it to state illusion because it is not a solution and, and it's never been. It's not. It's not on. But he he is very. He was always very keen to not only prevent uh, any kind of Palestinian state, but even in any talk of the Palestinian uh, 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 Palestinian state or stateless uh, on 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 the part of the American administration. And for this reason, he actually. Uh, 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 help to foster Hamas in, in, in Gaza. This is known to the Israeli public and, and uh, uh, th there are calls in the middle of this war while he is leading the, the, the war government to uh, 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 force his resignation. So uh, it is not an anti-war feeling, it is anti-government feeling that is now dividing Israeli society. Um, about action that, that that will not cannot be called atrocities. I, I, I think Sumaya has, has actually referred to the uh, freedom march in, in Gaza in, in 2018, which was uh, uh, non-violent and was met with brutal violence on, on the part of the Israeli uh, military. Uh, as for you know voting. How, how you should vote in the United States, it's not, not for me to say. I don't feel that I know enough about uh, uh, party politics in the United States uh, to offer any, uh, any responsible advice. Uh, you work it out. Uh, as far as the uh, uh, harm in, in uh, the uh, Term apartheid as, a, as applied to Israel. Well, look, it's 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 a, it's a it's a it's a complicated issue. According to the official formal definition of apartheid, it certainly applies to the uh, case of Israel, not only within in in the uh, the territories occupied in 1967, but in the whole of the territory. Uh, uh, ruled by Israel, including, uh, the, of course, the, the part of Syria that is, has been annexed. Uh, so I, I mean, the term is, is, is correctly applied in, in, in terms of, of its juridical applicability. It is, it is correct. However, uh, apartheid, like racism, which, of which apartheid is just a form, uh, has many forms, many, I mean, in, in the United States, for example, you have two forms of racism, racism against uh, uh, black people and uh, racism against indigenous Americans. It is a very different uh, form of racism. One is, is uh, class-based, the, the black people are, uh, 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 have been enslaved and they are and they are, they are, the, the racism against, against Blacks is, is mainly class-based. The racism against indigenous Americans is, is colonialism-based. It's a, it's a different form of racism. Uh, uh, black people in the American constitution are worth three-fifths of a person. Uh, Indians in the American constitution are worth nothing. So the racism comes in different, you know, 57 varieties. The, uh, uh, the the form of, of apartheid uh, uh, operated by Zionism is, is different from what existed in South Africa. And to this extent, it is sometimes misleading because when people hear apartheid, they immediately think of South Africa. And the situation couldn't be more different in certain respects. As I try to explain, the political economy was completely different. Uh, so, uh, Yes, I mean, uh, you can use apart the, the, the use of apartheid has certain advantages in, in propaganda terms, but it can also be misleading because it can drive people to imagine that uh, uh, the Israeli Zionist colonialism is of the same kind as South African. And this is a, a, a mistake, at least as far as, as uh, uh, the political economy is concerned, which is for a Marxist, 
the, the key to understanding a situation. Thank you, Moshe. Thanks, Moshe. Yeah, I mean, just on, on that question on abuse of the word apartheid, I think um, it is important to understand the, the way that the political economy is different from South Africa, but as Moshe also said, that it the term does apply to the segregation and like the structure of racism that exists. And I think that's important because um, that is the way in which um, uh, the charge of apartheid is being leveled against Israel right now in the International Criminal Court. Um, and uh, I think in the, the question, the way that the question was phrased um, by, I don't remember the person's name or maybe there was no name, but was why not use the term ethnic cleansing? Um, and I think it, we should definitely use the term ethnic cleansing and I don't think it's an either or, but in international law, ethnic cleansing is not a charge that can be um, applied in the way that apartheid is. And that is part of the reason why the charge was the charge of apartheid. Um, and happy to discuss that more, or maybe provide more resources if people want to read about that a little bit more. Um, and then to the question of, of um, uh, the Israeli left, I, I don't want to talk about it too much, but I also saw that a follow-up question was put in, in, in um, the Q&A about what is the difference between working class in the US and the working class in Israel if both um, uh, were settler colonies in both um, uh, uh, committed genocide. Um, and I, I want to drop just as like a, a beginning to, to answer this, um, which I won't do now, but I want to drop an article that Dufna and myself um, co-wrote about the nature of the Israeli working class and why part of it answers this question of how is it different from the U.S. working class? Why are we able to build U.S. working class solidarity um, uh, across race, across culture, across ethnic, ethnicities, et cetera. Um, and why is that not the case in Israel? So I'm gonna drop the article here. Um, and then as we're running out of time, um, there's a question of the Democrats. You know, I, I think like that's a whole event on its own where we can discuss the US, US political scene. What I will say about, about the Democratic Party in the last two months um, is that the fact that there is a Palestinian in Congress and the fact that Cori Bush, um, like this open socialist who openly supported BDS as a candidate when she was running for Congress, um, um, that made a big difference in, in that it allowed for there to be a vehicle in Congress for a ceasefire to begin with. When the call from Gaza came out that the, that the demand was for a ceasefire and um, Corey was able to um, uh, draft and release the ceasefire resolution and that that became a tool, a vehicle for people in government and for us on the streets to pressure people in government to sign on to that, to support that. That was incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and it allowed for, I think, a very um, tactical, strategic inside outside strategy that actually seems to be working, not working insofar as stopping what's happening, but working insofar as changing the narrative in the US and making it clear that there is a division, there is a, um, a, uh, uh, a disagreement um, between where the administration stands, where the US administration stands, the, the State Department, the Biden administration, and where Congress is increasingly leaning, or at least a good section of it, a, a chunk of it is, is going. In fact, while we were on this call, news broke that the State Department just decided a, an emergency approval of 13,000 ammunition, tank ammunitions to Israel, um, meaning that this was not something that Congress, they bypassed Congress. Usually Congress has to sign off, has to vote on this for it to pass. I mean, that's the point of having a Congress, especially in cases like this. And instead, the State Department invoked an emergency clause to have this happen without Congress's approval. Um, and I think that's another indication of this, this split that's happening between the State Department and the Biden administration and Congress. Um, and this same ceasefire resolution and the way that the narrative is shifting right now is also the reason why, for the first time ever, there are conversations happening over US funding to Israel. There are conversations in Congress happening that are a direct result of um, things like 
Cory Bush's ceasefire resolution, and then of course the massive show of support in the U.S. that polls have have um, confirmed. The fact, that the majority of Americans support a ceasefire. The fact that there are these protests every single day in every single industry, from campuses to unions to people in their workplaces, um, people in their schools. People are out in the street every single day um, in cities across the country. Um, and that hasn't stopped. The momentum has not stopped. The momentum has not slowed down. It's continuing to build, in fact. Um, and I think that is part of the reason why there are now discussions in Congress about whether or not the U.S. should continue to fund Israel. Um, and I think that's also part of the reason why this emergency measure was just invoked by the State Department, because they didn't want to go through Congress, because they knew that that would become a whole debate, that would become a whole spectacle in and of itself, and so they bypassed them to do this. Um, and I think that's that's really important. I think that the really um, sort of harrowing, horrifying reality of this that we also need to contend with is that what it took for this question to be even raised is tens of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza being massacred, right? Is like half of the infrastructure of the Gaza Strip being completely destroyed. That that's what it took for this question to even be raised. Um, and I think that's that's the harrowing reality of the moment that we're in and knowing that it isn't even over, um, that, that the genocide is unfolding, it hasn't ended, the bombing hasn't stopped, the ground invasion hasn't stopped and Israel has shown no signs of slowing down and the US, the Biden administration at least, has not shown any signs of um, uh, forcing Israel to stop beyond these really meaningless, empty, hollow statements of, you know, uh, be careful of civilian life. Also, here's another 13,000 tank ammunitions. Also, here's another $14 billion in weapons. Also, here's our newest bombs that we've just produced. You know, here you go, Israel, be careful of civilians. And so it's, it's just like this hollow, empty statements from the Biden administration, from the State Department, um, that is um, increasingly at odds and increasingly um, sort of showing like a, a stark juxtaposition between them and where the majority of Americans stand and increasingly where different members of Congress are going. Um, so that's that's kind of like my beginning at answering the question about Democrats. Um, I think it's it's we're at a point now where it's no longer, you know, it's no longer just like Cory Bush in Congress saying we should stop funding Israel. Um, that said, we're still nowhere near where we need to be. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to sort of create an illusion of where Congress is at, or even people who support ceasefire are not yet where we need them to be on so many other things. Um, but I think this moment is um, uh, kind of taking the mask off of Israel and um, forcing forcing people to, to contend with what it really is. Um, and there's a lot of work still to be done to push people beyond just ceasefire. Um, you know, ceasefire is such a minimum demand. I mean, it, it's the word ceasefire. This is such a, this is such a, it's become such a powerful politicized word. Um, but the reality is it's such a bare minimum when you think about what is happening um, uh, on the ground in Palestine. And I want to say more, but we're out of time. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Samaya. And um, thank you, Moshe. You know, this is one of those conversations that could continue for a long time. And I know we have um, limited time. So what I will do is um, I'll reach out to uh, Samaya and, and Moshe um, through email, ask them, you know, about further resources, ways that folks can continue engaging in this um, and email that, share it to everyone. But Moshe, please go ahead. If you allow me, uh, please, since please. So, so Sumaya has read the poem, which is very effective. I would like to read you a poem which sums up the uh, present situation. It was written a long time ago by a, a late friend of, friend of mine, the, the poet Erich Fried, who was a, 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 an anti-Zionist uh, socialist uh, uh, Jewish poet. Uh, and it seems as though it was written specifically in order to describe what is going on. As usual with this poem, this is a short and very aphoristic poem, and it, it is a, a, a sort of philosophical observation on what is going on. It is called 
clean sweep, and here it comes. The causes now fight their effects so that one can no longer hold them responsible for the effects. For even to make them responsible is part of the effects. And effects are forbidden and punished by the causes themselves. They do not wish any longer to know about such effects. Anyone who sees how diligently they pursue the effects and still says that they are closely connected with them will now have to blame only himself. Think about it. Thank you, Moshe. So, um, as I said, folks who registered for this event um, will get an email from me. Thank you all for attending. And I'll also include uh, resources that Sumeya Moshe uh, have shared with me, ways um, that you can continue engaging in their work. Um, I will say you can check out uh, both of them online, I'm sure. I encourage folks to check out the DSA online and uh, NPEC in general. What I'd also like to do um, share in the chat here is a link to an event that's happening tomorrow, uh, specifically geared towards um, talking about these issues uh, with folks who are younger, uh, children, families. Um, I think that will be uh, a very interesting and, and dynamic event. And I did want to put it in the chat here just because it is uh, tomorrow. So um, the last thing I will say, yes, this is um, recorded. And after I talk with uh, the panelists to you know, check in about that, uh, you can expect it up on uh, YouTube. And I will also uh, share that through email with everyone who registered uh, for this event. If you have any concerns about that, uh, you can always get a hold of me. So with that, I uh, want to uh, take all of our gratitude and appreciation for uh, Sumeya and, and Moshe. Pass it on forward. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll continue to hear from you, learn from you, um, and, and keep on going. So take care, everyone, and, uh, and be well. Thanks, Luke and Molly. Thanks, Moshe. Nice to see you.